you have an object where all the pigments have faded away. Wouldn't it be great if you could still see where the paint had been applied? Welcome to the wonderful world of infrared luminescence on this episode of Ancient Egypt and the Bible. Today's video is a tutorial on how to set up and do infrared luminescence. We are going to walk you through the entire process of doing this interesting photographic technique that has an important application as a non-destructive testing method. Okay, so before we get into application, let's talk a little bit about the theory. Now, certain chemicals will absorb one wavelength of light that stimulates an electron, which then releases light of a different wavelength. A common example of this that you might be familiar with is when you shine a black light, which is ultraviolet light, on certain minerals or pigments that glow funky colors. That's exactly what's happening here is that the ultraviolet light is stimulating an electron that then releases light in a visible wavelength that you can see as those funky colors. Okay, so that's sort of the theory here of how it works. Now, there are a number of pigments that were used in ancient times that fluoresce when stimulated by certain wavelengths of light. These include Egyptian blue, also known as blue frit, hand blue, and hand purple. Now, the problem with these pigments is that they tend to fade over time. As these pigments lose water ions, the color of these pigments shift from blue and purple to sort of a dull white color. This makes these pig faded pigments blend with their substrates, making them practically impossible for the human eye to see. This is where near-infrared luminescence can help. And a special property of these pigments is that when you shine a red light upon them, they brightly fluoresce a near-infrared light. But the problem is near-infrared light is invisible to the human eye. But as long as you have the proper equipment to capture that infrared light, you can see where on an item these pigments were used even long after the color has faded away. And best of all, the procedure does not damage the artifacts in any way. So, let's sort of lay out what equipment you're going to need. Okay? So, some of this equipment you're going to need to purchase or modify, others you can improvise. But some you can't as well. And we'll get into all of it. Now, the first thing you're going to need is an infrared camera. Now, what you'll need is a DSLR camera with an appropriate camera lens and preferably a sturdy tripod. This is going to be your biggest capital expense. Now, generally, camera manufacturers don't make infrared cameras. However, almost every digital camera has a sensor that is infrared capable. Camera manufacturers normally put filters over the photodiode to screen out infrared and ultraviolet light. And normally, with open heart surgery on your camera, that filter can be removed. However, it is important to note that not all cameras can be converted into an infrared camera. Now, what most of us do is to take an old camera like this Nikon D50 and send it to the lab to be converted as an infrared camera. Now, the cost of this process can be quite expensive. And generally, you know, you buy an old camera like this Nikon D50 and have a lab like Kolari Vision convert your camera. And this is generally the least expensive way to do this. Now, this is not sponsored. This, <laughs> this video is not sponsored by Kolari Vision. Now, with that said, the cost of conversion can range from $300 to $700 depending on the type of camera being converted. 
So that's your biggest capital expense. Now we should also add that the camera should be capable of doing digital negatives because this will help you in the long run. Also, you should have a lens on this camera that is able to accommodate a lens filter because you will need that for the process. And that's your next expense is infrared light filters. Now you're going to need a small selection of infrared light filters. And what these do is they filter out visible light and let only infrared light in. Now they don't completely do that job, but they are helpful when you do this. Now you don't need the most expensive filters to do this. You know, cheap Neewear filters work fine and they're about $30 a piece. But I have them in, I have an IR720 filter, an IR760 filter, and IR950 filter. Now for most near infrared photography, the IR720 will do you just fine. But you are gonna need this. The next thing you're gonna need is you are going to need a red LED flashlight, okay? And this is what you're going to need to stimulate the infrared emission on the pigments that you want to test for. Now, you want to make sure that the wavelength that the infrared diode emits is 620 nanometers. And that's, that's the ideal wavelength for those blue-purple pigments to stimulate infrared emission. The good thing about it is you should be able to get that for relatively cheap, about $10. Should be, you should be able to get that for $10, no problem. And there's a lot of places to get that, like Amazon or AliExpress, and both of them supply those relatively cheap. So you don't need an expensive infrared flashlight to do this, but you do need one that does emit on that 620 nanometer wavelength. Okay? Now... The next thing you're going to need is infrared positive and negative samples. You will need two samples. One that does not luminesce, near infrared negative, and one that does luminesce, near infrared positive. Both samples should be roughly the same shape or sizes. You need these samples to show that your near infrared luminescence setup is working and to diagnose any problems. The near-infrared positive sample should contain some amount of Egyptian blue, hand blue, or hand violet. The near-infrared negative sample should be a dark color to prevent reflections from other samples. Now, you can do this the expensive way or the cheap way. The expensive way is to buy Egyptian blue from a specially pigment maker and then use charcoal pigment for your near infrared negative sample. The cheap way to do this is to buy 10 of these really, really cheap scarabs for about a dollar. The blue ones are likely to be near infrared positive. Other colors tend to be near infrared negative. I find that the brown or the black scarabs work really well for near infrared negative and the blue ones are are almost always near infrared positive so and the reason why is these things are made of colored faience and colored faience when fired turns to blue frit so it's a really cheap way i mean you could get these things free if you ever take a, go on vacation in egypt you know sometimes you'll pay your your hotel bill in Egypt, and they'll just throw a few of these onto the, uh, as a thank you. So, you know, keep these. Don't throw them away. They're useful. <laughs> now, the next thing you're going to need is a standard white. And a standard white is a bright standard white reflectance. 
Its purpose is to reflect as much diffuse light back as possible. A good standard white should reflect over 97% of light in the scene. Now, while it is tempting to use a glass mirror, most aluminum and silver mirrors only reflect between 80 to 95% of light. So they're not good enough. You can't use a mirror. And you shouldn't use a mirror. That'll just mess things up. A commercially made standard white like Spectralons offer 99% reflectance, but they can cost over $600. For something that just reflects white light, that seems a bit pricey to me. Okay. However, you can make a homemade version that is effective and fit for purpose. Now, I went to uh, Shopper's Drug and I bought a cheap makeup container with a lid. Now, the lid's really important. Because you want to keep your, your standard white clean. So this one's got a lid. Now what you do is you buy from a pigment store barium sulfate. That you bind that pigment with acrylic resin as a binder. And this will give you a standard white with a reflectance of 95 to 98%. And it costs only about $25. Close enough and better than a mirror. And finally, the last thing you're going to need is reference measures. Okay? These are rulers photographed alongside artifacts to show their scale. Now, some of these have color references as well, as well as having a, a ruler in black and white squares of a standard measurement unit, such as centimeters. Now, you can buy these commercially, and they are very expensive, costing up to $1,000. And they have to be replaced every three years because the colors shift. However, you are doing near-infrared photography. You don't need color squares because you're not doing any color correction. Also, pro tip, if you attend a lot of archaeological conferences, vendors give these away for free, and they work just fine for our purposes. The other thing you're going to need is imaging software. Now, I recommend that you get Adobe Photoshop or Adobe Lightroom, but any imaging software that can use a DCP profile file for your brand and model camera will work just fine. It also has to have the ability to edit digital negatives such as DNG or NEF files. Okay. Now for your imaging software, you need to consult your particular camera brand and online tutorials for info for how to set up your software because that's quite a process in and of itself. So that covers your equipment. Now your testing environment. Okay. To take a near-infrared luminescent photograph, you need to set up your photographing environment. You will need a dark room that keeps stray light out. Now, a little light flooding in is not going to be a huge deal, but you need most of the visible light out of the room because you don't want any stray infrared light reflecting off your sample. So you're going to set up your camera on a tripod, focus your camera, and mount the near infrared filter on your lens. Now, this camera already has it on, but you know, you can you can take it off and you see the the near infrared lens. Okay, so you mount that on on your lens. You set up your object to be photographed. Add your positive and negative samples to the scene, your standard white your photographic references and include your your red light. Okay? Make sure your red light is turned on and turn off all other lights to admit as much of the other white light as possible. Then take your photograph using the manual settings on 
and have your camera in digital negative mode. At that point, you should have a digital negative once you click the shutter. Then you're going to have to post process your photograph. And for that, you're going to import your digital negative file into the photo editing software. Use the profile from your DCP file to shift the palette of your negative to expose the infrared lighting. Then save your negative as a JPEG and the results at that point are pretty much instant. And it's obvious when you have a near infrared positive sample. Like for example, in this photograph here that I took from the Harvard Semitic Museum, which has now been renamed, which I can't remember to rename to what, but you can see here this bead from, from Mari has shows intense infrared luminescence because it was painted with Egyptian blue. But when you look at it through the normal light, it looks completely white. You would never know that it had any pigment at all. But this is the magic of near-infrared luminescence. You can see pigment that had been implied in ancient times that is all but faded now. So, anyway, that wraps up our tutorial on near-infrared luminescent photography. I hope you learned something. I hope you found that interesting. Thank you very much for watching, and we'll see you next time on Ancient Egypt and the Bible.